Malcolm Honline is the executive vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. As I've so often said, when Malcolm Honline speaks, the world listens. Recently, he has done pioneering work on the Abraham Accords, an American-led initiative which seeks to create peaceful relations between Israel and her Arab neighbors. As we approach the anniversary of Kristallnacht, of Pogromnacht, November 9th, 1938, it is a time each year for reflection, both upon what occurred and what we learned from the events of those horrible days leading up to the ultimate attempt at the final solution of eradicating the Jewish people. We know that many people were arrested, that people died, but they put this name of Kristallnacht to neutralize it, and they also put out false figures to minimize it. Thanks to the research of Beit Ashkenaz, in which I was privileged to participate and led to the publication of our two-volume study of all of the communities in which attacks on synagogues took place just in those areas under Nazi control that night. It was the beginning of the end, but it was also the end of the early stage that began with words of hate that led to deeds of hate that were promulgated and by the government and by official agencies, by the Nazi party, and eventually gained acceptance amongst broader and broader segments of the German people who could then stand by while synagogues were destroyed in their own communities, while they saw their neighbors of decades, even centuries, being removed and ultimately being sent to concentration camps and annihilation. So we look back in order to look forward. We look back to those days to understand what we learned from it, what we do to prevent future generations from ha having to suffer those trials and tribulations. But frankly, it's not for the Jewish community alone, and perhaps even primarily it is for the non-Jewish world, for them to learn, to take responsibility. I sat with the head of the World Muslim League and a number of survivors, Sheikh Muhammad Allah Isa, and very interestingly, he had requested the meeting and told them, I want to hear your stories, but I also want to know what are the lessons we learned from it that we must apply today. And so... This annual commemoration is not just to dwell on the tsarists and the tragedies of the past, but to learn from it as we meet the challenges of today. The Abraham Accords, whose anniversary we celebrated recently, was a monumental change in many ways, but it was the culmination of many years of efforts. As we researched the book on Kristallnacht, Pogromnacht, we found the records of the Jews who were saved in Muslim countries. And I started to look into it and saw how Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, in Samarkand and Bukhara saved hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives. They were obviously under Soviet control at the time, but they were welcomed. Situations weren't always easy or good, but because of it, these Jews were saved, and little recognition was paid, paid to it, nor to the long history, 2,600-year history in most countries in Central Asia, of Jews living there, being welcomed there, living in peace, with no history of anti-Semitism. So it is not inherent in Islamic-Jewish relations that there be these kind of contentious relationships. In fact, as we see the rise of anti-Semitism around the world and in the United States, often with double-digit increases in hate crimes, and the vast majority of hate crimes are directed at Jews, religious hate crimes are directed at members of the Jewish community and Jewish institutions, we note that the one place in the world where we're seeing a decrease and serious efforts in many countries to address anti-Semitism is in the countries of the Abraham Accords. 
We've seen the changes in textbooks in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Holocaust commemorations in the UAE, Bahrain, and other countries. We see the changes that led by Morocco, uh, where His Majesty has courageously adopted the Aladdin project and seen to the restoration of a lot of the historical Jewish sites to remind people, the Muslim population, of the Jewish contributions and the importance of the Jewish community in Morocco. And we see it throughout the Abraham Accord countries that there is a change, and then that is reflected in the polls and studies. The Abraham Accords are to me very specifically important. I began more than 30 years ago efforts to reach out to the Gulf because I believed that we have so much more in common and the problem is that we let outsiders and the negative forces dominate the discussion. And we found that the more we talked, the more we found what we have in common. Just recently I had a dinner with six Muslim ambassadors from six of the Central Asian Muslim countries. And as we sat in a very long evening, a most wonderful evening, we found more and more that we have in common, things that we can do together, our common interest in the next generation and seeing to it that they don't carry on the legacy of hate, which is so destructive, and how much we have to gain from each other, how much they have to gain from a relationship with the state of Israel, addressing many of the critical challenges from water reclamation, energy independence, all the things that Israel has achieved in high tech, which would benefit all of these countries if they were barred for, from it because of these artificial divisions. That is not to say there aren't political differences. They aren't isn't to say that everything, everybody has to march in lockstep. No. What the Abraham Accords show us, that when we turn the focus on the positive, on what we have in common, not just what divides us, we find how much we can build on that and how we identify the fact that the differences are much less than the things that unite us. That we can work together to the benefit of the people in the region of all faiths, but also for the world at large. It sets an example to many. Perhaps if countries in the world had united against the Nazi threat early on, if they had taken the events of Kristallnacht seriously and had responded to it, then perhaps the outcome would have been very different, not just for the six million Jews, but for the tens of millions of others who paid the ultimate price for this hatred. So this year on Kristallnacht, it's a time for us to, again, re-examine where we are, where we have come to, and where we must go. And this is an obligation we have to our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Those who thought that the hatred of anti-Semitism had been defeated or pushed back under the rocks recognize today that this is a cancer. I don't believe you can eradicate it. I do believe that we can isolate the haters, that we can delegitimize them, that we can educate the next generation not to follow their messages of hate, but to pursue the positive messages represented in the Abraham Accords.